heavens. What are you, what are you doing? Right, that's a third then. Are you doing? Right, yours a second. And so here now, <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, which Anne's going to read from, to us. The great Pentecost reading. God bless you. The first reading is from Acts chapter 2 on page 1039 in the Church Bible. 1039. Acts chapter 2, starting at the first verse. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. One of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they'd had too much wine. But then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 37, and it's on page 868 in the Pew Bibles. The Valley of Dry Bones.
the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The third reading is coming from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. And it's on page 1135 in the Pew Bibles. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. 
In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Thank you very much to Anne and, and uh, Diane and Juliet for reading those readings there for us on this Pentecost Sunday. I feel a bit boomy. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right? Okay, good. Jesus promised before he left the earth that after he'd gone back to be with his father, <coughs> excuse me, he would send the Holy Spirit to earth. And these three readings we've just heard express three different ways in which the Holy Spirit comes to us. Firstly, we had that reading from Acts 2, where as a result of Peter's preaching, 3,000 people on the same day are converted to faith in Jesus Christ and are baptized. In one day, the work of the Holy Spirit has the effect of bringing 3,000 Jewish people to faith. The Holy Spirit comes in power that day. And the message is imparted in miraculous ways through the, the, the gift of tongues, which are then understood by the people who've come from all over the ancient world who don't know uh, necessarily the language that Peter was speaking in. But amazing, all that happening in one day. And then in our second reading, that from Ezekiel 37, we have um, a vision of a valley of dry bones, which at the end of the prophetic process are then transformed to a vast army of men on their feet. The spirit touching every dry bone and reforming it with ligaments and sinews and covering it with flesh getting the men on their feet, and then finally they become a whole vast army. That uh, second passage from Ezekiel is often referred to um, uh, when, when um, <clears throat> we're thinking about times of revival, when God does something absolutely incredible and unexpected in the lives of whole communities. And I think, for example, of the Welsh revival, when about, you know, around about the year 1900, um, <clears throat> well, just before, the land was a spiritual wilderness, like a valley of dry bones, where the men were drinking and swearing, and I don't know what else they were up to. And the, the Spirit came, not just not through, as the result of anybody's preaching, but that necessarily, but the Spirit sparked off in all kinds of places, in the pubs, uh, and, uh, and then the men down in, in the pits were being convicted of their sin and coming to faith, and the Spirit swept across Wales in this way, and it's the, Wel you know, the Welsh revival. Working the Spirit from the, the grassroots up and touching individual people's lives. Um, the only experience I have of this quite like that is the stories the Roma people tell me how they were touched in this way so the other day a week ago two of them were helping Margaret and I move into the new house we're moving into and we were having something to eat afterwards and um, in a pub 
and they looked in, the guys looked incredibly embarrassed to be in, in this ordinary English pub. And I said, look, don't worry, we're no, we're, nobody's going to get drunk around here and everything, and we're, we're just drinking orange juice, it's fine. And then one of them said, when we used to go to the pub, it wasn't like that. We used to get drunk out of our brains, completely, completely drunk. And then I said, well, obviously you're not like that anymore. Well, what happened? Did, who came and told you that wasn't a good way to live? And there was a silence, and they said, no one came. Well, how, what happened then? And they said, God came. God came into the pubs and convicted us of getting drunk and going home and beating our wives up and spending all the little money we had on drink. God came and convicted us. And uh, this is the famous Toflian revival in East Romania. Thousands and thousands of people were converted, and they've spread many of them across Europe and beyond now. So that's the second kind of way the Holy Spirit can come, through the spontaneous eruption of the Spirit in the hearts of lives and of men and women, wherever they are. But then in the third reading, from Romans 8, we encounter a different kind of activity of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit at work, rather like a backdrop, there all the time. Paul writes to the Romans that the whole creation is groaning as, as a woman might groan when she's in labor pains. The whole creation growing. Everything that God has made is actually groaning, he says. He speaks of our present suffering. He speaks of the creation's bondage to decay its propensity to be constantly falling apart. He speaks about the Christian community of faith inwardly groaning. And when we stop and think about human history and the human condition, we have to say, don't we, that actually an awful lot of human history and human experience is like that. The experience of suffering, the experience of Decay, the experience of things just not coming right. And what Paul is saying here is that the Holy Spirit is active in this. The Holy Spirit is active in every last tiny corner of the created world, of the cosmos, of the everything that exists. This is hard to get our heads around. So let's sum that up so far. Acts 2. Pentecost, one man preaches, 3,000 are converted one day. An incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel, a valley of dry bones are raised to their feet, formed into an army. The language of revival, the unpredictable outpouring of the Holy Spirit across the board. And then this third reading from Romans 8 where we hear of the work of the Holy Spirit active in the brokenness of this created order. It's worth just remembering that in the beginning, in Genesis 1, we read of the Ruach of God, the Spirit, the breath of God, the wind of God, being active in the creation process. There, the Spirit from the beginning, working, drawing forth creation. So should it be a surprise that the Spirit is still present as the creation process goes on and much of it is fragmented and broken and decaying. No, it shouldn't be a surprise. And so this, this morning, this particular sermon is not a classic Pentecost sermon that you might hear. On my heart right now <clears throat> is a guy called Alan, who many of you know, who I um, went to pick up from Brixton Prison on Friday morning. We met, we had a big hug, we had a good time together, we had something to eat. Um, he had the prisoner given him not a penny, he really didn't know where he was going to go. They hadn't set up anything for him, that's why I went to meet him. Took him down to Wandsworth, no room in the, in, in the inn, anywhere. So eventually he, <coughs> he went off on a, on a, 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 to, to um, Guildford, 
And he told me, there's definitely going to be a place for me, Martin, in Guildford. Later that night, when I was back here, I got a message saying, uh, there was no room in Guildford. When I phoned his mobile now, which I put some money on so he could be in touch, no answer. No answer, sign. I phoned his son. I don't know where my dad is. I don't know what's happened to him, but I do know the last time he came out of prison, out of Milton Keynes, the next thing I, the same thing happened, and I, I didn't hear anything. And the next thing, I was a letter from prison saying I crashed. I crashed. I went to have a drink, and I crashed, and I was arrested and put back in prison. So all the signs are that this man, who is converted to Christ, right? who has um, given his testimony in prison to 300 people before his baptism in Brixton Prison, uh, who has clocked up all kinds of awards and uh, A-levels and NVQ awards and all the stuff you could possibly wish for, who has a vocation under God to lead pe help people who has the, have the same <clears throat> alcohol and violence problems that he has. Every <clears throat> this man, I don't know what's happened to him. But the, it is a strong possibility he will have crashed again, will already be in prison again. And then that same Friday, texts started coming through to me that our dear Justin was in Watford General Hospital and might have had a stroke. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm on my way home, maybe I can pop in and see him. <clears throat> He's here this morning playing his drums. God bless him. Hallelujah. Give him a... <laughs> <clears throat> and then, you know, I went to visit Ted last uh, week at home. Poor old Ted is languishing. This dear, saintly man, this brother in Christ of ours, is languishing at home. And meanwhile, pastoral crises for which there are no quick fixes. You see, my friends, we cannot be on a spiritual high all the time. We cannot live as though Pentecost is going to happen every day, the, as it did <clears throat> when Peter stepped out of that room and preached. We need to plummet the depths too. The Spirit is according to the scriptures, everywhere. Hear these famous words from Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my de bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. <coughs> Excuse me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will be not dark to you. The night will shine like the day. The dark for darkness is as light to you. So here is the psalmist speaking of the activity of the Holy Spirit when he's up on the crest of the wave, but also when he's down in the depths. He can't even get away from that Spirit, because wherever he goes, the Spirit's there. You might say before him, psalm begins, before a word is on my tongue, you even know it, Lord, before I've even said it, before I was made in my mother's womb, you saw my unformed shape. The Spirit, there before him, so if he's going to go down into the depths, the Spirit's there in the depths before he gets there. How amazing is this? It, it, it's actually more amazing, really, than what happened on Pentecost when Peter came out and preached, isn't it? I think it is. The Spirit everywhere. On Friday, it was uh, just after leaving my friend Alan, I was listening to a DVD, uh, sorry, a, 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 D, a CD on my car radio, about what happened after the, at the end of the Second World War. The Allied forces had reduced the city of Dresden to a heap of rubble. There was a great firestorm. Everything collapsed. Germany was in ruins, as was much of Western Europe. 
and beyond. But in Germany, where most, a fifth of the men had died and many were, were injured and, of course, many racked with guilt, in Germany, there were the Trümmerfrauen, the women of the ruins. So after the fires had settled, for example, in Dresden, the women must have gone up and thought, what do we do now? What do we do? Our men, many of them are dead. We've lost the war, and our beautiful city has been reduced to rubble. What do we do? So they went out and simply brick by brick by brick by stone took the rubble and cleared their city, the Trümmerfrauen, the women of the, of the ruins. And do you know, Germany, the, which was more devastated than any other of the countries in Europe, Germany put back its country physically in terms of buildings more quickly than any other city in, in Europe. Those women of the ruins, where did their, their strength come from? Where did their will to live come from? The Holy Spirit must have had something to do with that. The activity of the Spirit. Just get up and do it. It reminds me of the day after my brother died when we all came home and my mother was down on her knees just cleaning the kitchen floor, carrying on, as women are so good at doing. So the Holy Spirit would have been active in convicting the German nation of its terrible crimes, the Nazis, but it would, the Holy Spirit was also help there, helping them rebuild their, their uh, country out of the ashes. And amazingly, that country of Germany welcomed thousands and thousands of refugees from other countries, uh, German-speaking peoples who were told that you had to hit, um, Churchill said, you've got to go back to Germany, you've got to go to Germany. And the Germans welcomed them in. And then, of course, many years later in 1989, the German people had the creativity and imagination to welcome thousands and thousands and thousands of East Germans when the Berlin Wall fell. Anybody out there thinking, what on earth has this got to do with Pentecost and the Holy Spirit? I think it's got everything to do with it. Because the German economic recovery has been described as a miracle. The Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle that this country smashed, recovered in this way, in this remarkable way. Many German Christians prayed for the coming of the Spirit that their country would be rebuilt and they would recover from the terrible things their fathers and had done. National recovery, God part of the process. I suggest to you dry bones in a valley being reformed by the work of the Spirit. A whole nation being put back together through the work of individual people who decided, I, whatever my dad did, I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to be part of the solution in rebuilding my life, my family's life, what's left of it, my country's life. Consciously or, un or unconsciously attuning themselves to the nudgings and promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, my friends, do you know something? Most of the time, I don't know how to pray. But the really good news is that the greatest theologian of all time and evangelist, arguably, of all time, St. Paul, also said he didn't know how to pray. He said, there from that passage we heard read, we don't know what we ought to pray for. Do you feel like that ever? That you don't know how to pray? I do, often. 
But then he goes on to say, we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to pray, because the Spirit is interceding for you with these groans that have no words because words aren't enough. Words aren't going to get it. Words are too inadequate. So it has to come out in groans. Sometimes the situation is so broken, you will all know of situations which are so broken that you, you cannot even think anymore how to pray. Or the person you love is so sick that you don't know how to pray. Paul goes on. This same spirit searches our hearts. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of the Father. So when we don't know what's the will of the Father, whether somebody is to go on living for another 10 years or just to die soon, when we don't know which of the two is, it doesn't matter because the Spirit intercedes for us according to the perfect will of the Father. You see. God's Spirit there again interceding before the throne of heaven before us. These groans, what are these groans then? Maybe they're, for some people, speaking in tongues, words beyond language, sometimes interpreted. These groans, they have a resonance with the labor pains of the, the word Paul speaks of, of the, like the woman in labor waiting, groaning for the, for, for, for the child to come. These groans can be the deep lament that you hear not often in English worship, but sometimes in other communities. The pain is so deep that the community actually groans together. Some of us will groan silently in our authentic English way. But think of the Syrian Christians right now. Their cities and towns and heritage being destroyed by ISIS. Where is the Holy Spirit in that? I say the Holy Spirit is active in the midst of their torment. I say that the Holy Spirit, can you get this bit, is active trying to convict the perpetrators of evil. Trying them to get to see how evil their ways are. Holy Spirit comforting the afflicted and trying to afflict the comfortable. Paul speaks here in verse 23 of how we eagerly wait for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. When we studied this passage in the MLT yesterday morning, well done those of you who did get there, when we studied this passage, somebody said, we're not very good at waiting, are we? We're not very good at eagerly waiting. I thought, yeah, that is it. We need to learn how to wait eagerly because we are in an instant gratification culture. We want things to come right immediately. We're in a cheap happiness culture, what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. But we need to remember it cost Jesus his whole life to give us redemption of our bodies. Jesus said, it would cost us something too. So we are not good at eagerly waiting. We, we demand that our politicians set our problems to right quickly, immediately. And if we don't, we vote them out. We demand that our doctors make us well now. Ted said to me, I don't know what's gone wrong. Sometimes there is no quick fix. Healing may come over decades, over a lifetime. 
rather than in days. We need to learn to wait and maybe wait for a long time sometimes before we detect the fruit of the Spirit. You know the passage we heard from Ezekiel um, there that Diane read for us? There are three stages in it, aren't there? There's the first stage when there's nothing but dry bones all across the valley. Then the Spirit... The, the, the Ezekiel and the prophecies obeys the command of God and breathes the wind of the Spirit, the breath of the Spirit over the bones, and they start to rattle and form together with sinews and flesh covers them and everything. So still breathless bodies on the ground. And then the next stage comes, and they are raised up onto their feet, but are still actually inactive. And then the Spirit comes a third time, a third wave, and then you have a whole army ready to go on its feet. Three stages. I've always read this or heard this passage thinking that all happened boom, boom, boom. Like on the day of Pentecost. Dead bodies, valley of dry bones, and like later in the day, a few hours later, a whole army. But it occurred to me for the first time yesterday that maybe there was a long, long period between each stage of growth, of re restoration. Maybe decades. Maybe even generations between this and this. And if you think of the, the restoration of Israel, from, because those, those words were given to them when they were captives in Babylon, if you think how long that took until they had a land of their own in 1948, that's centuries. We're not very good at waiting, are we? We want the thing right away it took decades for God to reform Germany reform put back together and get them to reform from their the ways, bad ways of the Nazis it can take a decade for a person we are told to come to closure in their grief process as they mourn the loss of their loved one. It doesn't take just days or weeks or months. It, it might take as much as 10 years before you feel, I have now grieved to my loved one and I can begin to move on. And you know, it can take years sometimes for a person to be able to say to somebody who has hurt them, I forgive you. I forgive you. We cannot expect always that to happen immediately because the Spirit is at work in the heart of the grieved person whose heart has turned to stone. Think of the Ezekiel 36 we had. Turned to stones with what has happened. And it's the long, slow workings of the Spirit in that person's heart that gradually turns it into a heart of flesh. Long, slow process of healing. And so you, today, you didn't have a classic sermon, Pentecost sermon, where we say, right, let's have Pentecost again. Today, now, maybe it will happen like that. Nor did you have a sermon saying, why aren't we getting revival? We should have revival. Maybe when the new vicar comes, we'll have revival. <laughs> what I've been focusing on is the work of the Holy Spirit across the sweep of time in the lives of individuals and the lives of communities. You see, now the problem is, as we come to a close, the problem is that you te there tend to be three types of church in my observation. One is the Pentecost Acts 2 church, right? Where 
the only way of understanding the work of the Spirit is in a spontaneous uh, outpouring, as on the day of Pentecost. And then the other type of next type of church, quite close to that one, is the church of churches praying for revival, praying for revival to come, and the sense that nothing's really quite going to ever happen until we get revival. What are we doing wrong? Why haven't we got revival? That sort of thing. And then there's the third type of the church, which only is in this place I've been speaking about, of darkness and suffering and groaning and pain. Now, I want to say to you that I believe a fully scriptural church actually has all those three. We, we need to be open to the spontaneous movement of, of preaching, of, of the spirits through preaching and through whatever else we might do, yeah? We want to be open to the spontaneous movement of the Spirit out there, wherever, in the work of revival. But we also want to be open to the work of the Spirit on the slow, long haul. That's the kind of church which I believe Jesus came to earth to create. That's the work of the Spirit I see understand from the scriptures. So, what I'd like to do now, if I may, I suspect that what, as I've been speaking about some of the things people are going through, that some of you will be thinking, oh, well, yes, I'm carrying this, or I know somebody who's going through that. What I'd like you to do now, as Betty comes forward to lead us um, into, into prayer, is to come forward if you would like to, and I would love you to, and be anointed by oil. May it be for yourself, maybe for a person or a, a group of people or even a nation that God has placed on your heart. And as Betty prays, just feel free to come forward. I've got some special oil here that was blessed on Maundy Thursday in the cathedral and we'll just see what God's spirit does now and just one little observation it, what, what God does through his spirit may or may not be visible and apparent right now but again that work of the spirit, that receiving of the spirit may cash out over time, over the week to come, month to come maybe years to come, if we open ourselves to that. Come, Holy Spirit.